Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel Talented Reads. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read in June. So as always you know let's start with some stats. In the month of June I read a total of 20 books. So this is the sixth month in the year where I've read 20 books, <laughs> so I'm keeping up on my trend. Um, I've read a total of 6,257 pages. My average rating was 3.9. I think that's been the highest average so far this year. And rightly so, because I read some freaking good books this month. I read one ebook and 19 physical books. For star ratings, I had four five stars. Yes, you heard that correctly. Nine four stars, three three and a half stars, and four three star books. So, as I said, a freaking awesome month. I read six new releases. These are books that came out this year. Three not so new releases, which are books that came out last year. Ten backlist books, which are books that came out 2020 or prior. And one ARC. And an ARC stands for Advanced Reader Copy which um, are basically early editions for books that are coming out later this year. So let's get into all the books. Um, I'm doing a horror challenge this year in which I read a group of books associated with a specific subgenre of horror, and each month I tackle a different subgenre. Um, I will do a dedicated horror wrap-up video next week, so let's just talk through those five books um, really quick here, and then I'll get into like more about it in the wrap-up video next week. So first is Nosferatu by Joe Hill. This is about Charlie Manx, who saves parents Saves, I'm sorry, saves children from parents he believes are not good parents. He kidnaps them and brings them to Christmas land, where it's Christmas every day. Next is Unburied Carol by Josh Mallerman. This is about Carol, who has died multiple times. Well, she's not really dead because she always wakes up. But this time is different because this time her husband wants her to stay dead. Ring Shout by P. DeJelly Clark. In this book, the Ku Kluxes are working to bring about the end of the world. But Marcy and her fellow fighters are fighting back. Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. This is about a teen prank at the movie theater involving a mannequin that goes horribly wrong. And lastly is Smithy by Amanda Desiree. Um, this is about a group of college researchers who are pulled together for a project on teaching a chimpanzee known as Smithy the art of language through American Sign Language. But they start to question Smithy in this house as the project continues. That was a great lineup, right? Some really great books for the Horror Challenge. I can't wait to talk more about those books, so tune in next week for that wrap-up. Um, I did a weekend reading vlog in June. I'll link that video in the description box if you'd like to check it out. But in that vlog, I read three books. First, I read Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory by Caitlin Doughty. 
Uh, this is a nonfiction about Caitlin's start in her uh, mortuary career where she gets her first job at a funeral place and then, you know, as the book carries on, um, we kind of follow her as she continues her career to kind of where she's currently at today. Um, I thought the book was well done and I definitely learned some new things that I didn't realize about the funeral industry and it was nice to kind of be able to understand a little bit of what goes on behind the scenes and you get a sense that what Kaylin is trying to do is bring this awareness of death and get people more involved in that kind of aftercare of their loved ones um, I mentioned this in the vlog, but as someone who is kind of scared to die, I think this certainly helps me come to terms with that a little bit. Um, and you know, I appreciate what she's trying to achieve, but I also think that there are people who just don't care to be involved and don't want to know. And I think that should be okay too, you know? I think death is a very personal thing. Um, so, yeah, all in all, I thought it was kind of just an okay book. Next, I read Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Uh, way different tone <laughs> after reading the book about death. Um, this is about Nora who has agreed to a month-long vacation to Sunshine Falls with her sister, Libby. There, she is supposed to be learning how to kind of cut ties of work and be a little more spontaneous. But she keeps running into Charlie, an editor from back in the city, one whose first impression several years ago was not romantic or kind in any sort of way. Um, okay, so I freaking love this book. Um, it is a romance, and I don't read a lot of romance, like hardly any. But I will say Emily Henry is definitely an author that I feel safe reading romance from and this is my favorite of the romance books that I've read of hers. Um, this is a kind of enemy to lovers kind of romance. Um, Charlie is just adorable and I really liked the dynamic between Nora and Charlie as well as them with Libby being there, um, you know, the characters in the book seems more flawed, I would say, than in her past books, which I appreciate because I think it just makes them seem more realistic and makes then the love that grows between the two people just seem more realistic. Um, and you know, there were, of course, some steamy scenes because... It's a romance, so of course there were steamy scenes. <laughs> the last book that I read for this weekend vlog was Death in Her Hands by Otessa Moshve. Vesta is out for a walk in the woods behind her home when she happens upon a note. The note says, her name was Magda. Nobody will ever know who killed her. It wasn't me. Here is her dead body. Vesta is, of course, shaken by the note and becomes increasingly obsessed with discovering the author of the note and just who Magda was. Okay, so first of all, I would say after hearing that, you're probably like, wow, that sounds like a really good mystery. And you're right, it does sound like a really good mystery, but this is not a mystery book. This book is not here to solve Amanda's death. Um, instead, what you get is just this fantastic story of Vesta, who's a widow, um, and kind of her 
descend into paranoia and madness as she becomes more and more obsessed with this note that she found. Um, you know, there's flashbacks to her and her relationship with her husband who's passed on. Um, there's a lot of grief and trauma and healing and she's trying to do this kind of in comparison and relationship with this mad to person that she believes um, she kind of knows and understands. Uh, it was just really good. There are some times <clears throat> where you're thinking is this really happening or is she just imagining it? Like what's going on? It really kind of starts to mess with you too. So this was great. I highly recommend this. All right, next we have the one arc that I read, Wake the Bones by Elizabeth Kilcone. Uh, Laurel returns to her hometown after dropping out of college to resume her life as a tobacco hand and taxidermist. But the devil is there waiting for her in the woods. So I really had high hopes for this, but I feel like it let me down a little. Uh, the biggest thing for me that I just, <laughs> I had trouble like getting past was the characters. Um, there's a group of them and, you know, obviously we know that Laurel drops out of college, so they're of college age. And therefore, I attribute them to being adults, but they acted very juvenile still. And I felt like the book was trying hard to get them through some adult situations and make adult decisions, but it just didn't feel like it quite got there for me. It just felt like these characters were kind of forced into this weird situation you know you have this adult story in the background and these juvenile kids it just didn't seem to go together for me um and then of course after i read it i realized it's a young adult so maybe that's why but i don't know i just i had trouble getting past that um but i will say this is my first bone magic book and i loved that aspect and of course, you know, the dark woods and books <laughs> will always be my favorite. Um, also, it wasn't quite uh, an explosive ending as I had hoped. Like, things were going down, it was getting good. And then, like, the next chapter is, like, set months later. It's like, Am I missing pages or something? Like, it just seemed to, like, be there, and then it was gone, and then it was like, oh, everything's happy, go lucky. You know? I don't know. It felt like that needed to be flushed out a little bit more. But a big thank you to NetGalley and Wednesday Books for the art. Moving on, I read The Push by Athlete Ashley Audrain. We follow Bly as she becomes a first-time mother to Violet and determines that she won't be like the mother she had. But as the book grows on, Bly starts to think that there's something seriously wrong with her daughter. Um, <coughs> okay, so I will admit that I was not too impressed with this book. Um, and I definitely am not the norm here. Like, this book has a four-star average rating on Goodreads, so obviously there's a ton of people out there who like this book. Um, I think for me, Blind You Can Tell is dealing with some postpartum depression, though she denies it. And I still think... Like, she doesn't even really want to be a mother at this time. This is just kind of like, that's what she's supposed to do. And I feel like they didn't address that mental part of it, which I don't know. I don't know that I agree with. Um, 
And, you know, there's just a lot of motherhood stuff in here. It's not really something I can relate with. Not something I care to relate to. <laughs> um, I never really cared for Bly as a character. However, with all of that said, the last freaking sentence of the book blew my mind. Loved it. Beast by Peter Bonchelli is about a giant squid-like monster from the deep ocean who's come out of hiding with a need to kill and feed. Um, so I was hoping to like this one more than I did. I will say this book was a great reminder that the ocean is a fucking scary place. But I think what did it for me is this book just seemed like Jaws with a different type of sea monster. I mean, I've never read Jaws, but I'm thinking of the movie and comparing it to that because Peter Benchley, who wrote this book, also wrote Jaws. Um, you know, this guy goes out and he tries to hunt this thing after it's killed a bunch of people already. Um... I don't know, it just feel kind of like I wasn't invested in the story, um, as I was kind of hoping I would be, so. Next is Dark Stars, an anthology edited by John F. D. Taff. This was a pretty good anthology, a lot of big names in the horror genre. Um, Mostly authors that I have read from before, but a couple of new ones. Um, I really appreciated the foreword that was written by Josh Malaman. Um, this book kind of said that it was, you know, basically like a nod to the horror genre. And Josh Malaman basically said, you know, horror is having a moment right now. And I certainly agree. And I love that, um, you know, this editor was able to pull kind of all of these big names together. Um, so it was, it was great. My favorites of this anthology were Papa Eye by Priya Sharma. The Familiar's Assistant by Alma Katsu, because, of course, my favorite is Alma Katsu. And Swim in the Blood of a Curious Dream by John F. D. Taff himself. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about the next two books together. They are Pets. And Bitter by Akoiki Amezi. Pet follows Jam, who has accidentally brought a creature alive from her mother's painting, a creature that goes by the name Pet. He's come alive with a sole purpose, which is to rid the world of a monster. Bitter, which is the prequel to Pet, um, this is about Jam's mother, Bitter, and it's kind of her backstory where she's a student at a special school um, called Eucalyptus, where she can focus on her paintings. But outside the school, a revolution has begun, and she must decide where she stands. So I will say that I read Pet before Bitter, and... I would recommend that to be the way to read it. Um, I think you actually get to know Bitter um, a little bit in the first book, which just sets up her story nicely for then reading Bitter. Um, I will also say that I enjoyed Pet a little bit more. I think the story of the monsters were certainly different in both books, but I liked the approach that Pet took. Um, and of course, there is certainly some commentary, um, which is very obvious, about standing up and fighting for your rights and using your voice and your skill set to help um, 
you know, equate the MSZ makes it obvious that, you know, not everyone can be on the front lines, but everyone can make a difference. So I appreciated that commentary. Next is Into the Forest and All the Way Through by Cynthia Paleo. Paleo? Uh, this is a true crime poetry collection written from 100 unsolved missing and murdered women in the U.S. Um, I've loved the concept of turning this into poetry. Um, it, it's just so heartbreaking and... Um, each poem lists the name of the missing or murdered, um, their race, their age at disappearance, the place, and investigating agency. And I loved that Cynthia chose to do that because I think in that there's hope that one day, you know, somebody will come forward and the families of these missing and murdered women will be able to have some sort of relief. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this. So these next books were all really enjoyable, <laughs> though all very different. Um, Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby is about Ike and Buddy, whose sons were married and brutally murdered. Ike, the black father, and Buddy, the white father, decide to team up to uncover and track down their son's killers. Ah, uh, so heartbreaking to read, but so hopeful at the same time. Like, you know what the fathers are doing is inherently wrong, right? Taking the law into your own hands. Um, but you wish so bad for them to get the revenge they deserve. Um, this book does a great job getting the reader to feel that anger and disgust that the fathers feel. And I was surprised at where the story ended. Um, so, yeah. The Hacienda by Isabel Tanis. Uh, this is about Beatrice, who marries the handsome Don Rodolfo and moves with him to Hacienda San Isro. But Beatrice soon finds out that there is something very wrong with the Hacienda. Um, desperate for help, she seeks the help of Padre Andres, who actually knows a thing or two about the Hacienda. So together, they try to ward off the evil before it's too late. So this was great. Um, and the depictions of the hauntings that happened were pretty freaking creepy. Um, this is advertised as Mexican Gothic meets Rebecca. And... I've never actually read Rebecca, but I think the Mexican Gothic comparison is a little unfair. Um, the two, I think, are very different. Um, I really enjoyed all of the characters in this book, and I thought that they all played into the narrative just beautifully. They came at the right times. Um, you know, at first you're like, why is it, like, why are we getting to know this character? And then they came back around and you're like, oh, I got it now. Um, Mexican Gothic took a little bit of a body horror turn, which this book didn't have. Um, so, and I, I think I gave Mexican Gothic like three stars. Like it was just okay. Um, but I actually liked this one better than Mexican Gothic, so I, I would recommend this if maybe you didn't like Mexican Gothic, um, or if you're into kind of gothic hauntings with, like, a little touch of magic. Um, yeah, I think this would be great. Next is Breathless by Amy McCulloch. Um, this book follows journalists... Cecily, 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 
Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, it follows that journalist who's been invited by the famous mountaineer Charles McVeigh as he attempts a record-breaking climb of Mansulu, which is like the eighth highest mountain in the world or something. But as the climb continues, one by one, people are dying, and she comes to realize there's a murderer in the group. <sighs> I do love a good stranded mountain thriller, and this one will definitely be added to my list of favorites. Um, I also love that the author herself has actually climbed Mount Manslu, and I think it said in there that she was like the first or the youngest Canadian woman to ever climb the mountain or something like that, which is really freaking cool. Um, and I think that just adds to the story because I was reading the story and I mean, obviously I've never <laughs> hiked a mountain. I'm not a mountaineer. I don't know any of the language and all that stuff that goes into it but it was really interesting and you could tell that whoever wrote the book like knew what they were talking about and so after I read that and then you know kind of read the author um bio in the back of the book I was like oh that makes sense so I think it just added a lot to the story having the author kind of know this mountain herself um and I thought the reveal of the killer was top notch um even though I kind of suspected that's who it was I still really liked how it played out um and I will say I would love to reread this in the winter time um because the scenes of the wind and the cold and uh, I would just love to read this while I'm snuggled up by the fire and just I think it would just like you would could get into the atmosphere of the book just a little bit more Alrighty, and the last two books that I have to talk about are my five stars. The Last Astronaut by David Wellington. This is a first contact story set in space. Uh, NASA bands together a group of scientists to send into space with one mission. Make contact. And in a race to get there first, they come to realize maybe these aliens aren't all that friendly. Okay, so I always say that I'm not a big alien horror fan, but the movie Alien is my all-time favorite movie, and now I've officially rated an alien horror book five stars, so... Maybe I should stop saying that. <laughs> uh, this was like nothing I've read before. I can't even imagine being put in the situation that these scientists and astronauts were put into. And the tension and that fear and the curiosity that plagues these scientists, you feel that as a reader 100%. I think that was my favorite. Like, I really felt like I was there with them. You know, you're there all the way. Everything that happens, everything they're seeing, everything they're experiencing, like, you're seeing it for the first time with them, which is just a fantastic thing um, as a reader. And these aliens are also nothing I've read before. And the whole premise behind this was just so unique. Um, you know, it's part body horror, part space sci-fi, but all the way a fucking thrill ride. <laughs> all right, last book for the month is also my favorite book that I read this month, and that is Black Tide by Casey Jones. Beth, who is house-sitting on the Oregon coast, decides to befriend her neighbor, Mike. And after a drunken one-night stand, they await to find out that a cosmic event has happened, but it's left something monstrous in its wake. Um, 
so I thought this was very like War of the Worlds set on a beach. <laughs> uh, kind of. These monsters were scary as hell and so freaking cool. Um, I also love that this book is like 90% set entirely inside of a car on the beach. But it never feels like boring or slow. You just feel that like dread that the characters are feeling like I'm not gonna freaking survive this. Like there's no way out. Um and you kind of start to feel a little bit claustrophobic, you know, as the characters are doing their thing and oh yeah, it was great. Oh, chef's kiss. All right, that's everything I read for the month of June. Drop a comment below and let me know how your June reading went. What was your favorite book that you read this month? Or maybe what was your most surprising book for the month? Thanks for stopping by and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.